um, that redundancy would be great if you right, can. Got it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Wonderful. So um, welcome everyone. So nice to see you for this May Intellectual Shamans discussion with our very special guest, um, Rianne Eitzler, and hosted as always by Sandra Waddock. Um, this platform of the International Humanistic Management Association is sponsored by the Galligan Chair of Strategy in the Carroll School of Management at Boston College and hosted by Gabelli School of Management at Fordham University. So again, warm, warm welcome to all of you. I know many familiar faces and some new. We're so pleased to have you today. Um, I think many or most of you know Sandra, so I'm not going to take up more time introducing her. I hope she'll forgive me, but I do want to make sure you have a chance to get to know Rianne and uh, more time for this discussion. Uh, just logistics wise, we will um, focus on Sandra and Rianne for a bit and then open um, open the conversation to everyone. And if you have questions, remarks, um, any resources you'd like to add, but particularly questions, please add them to the chat. Um, and that way we'll moderate the conversation from there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sandra. Again, warm welcome to all, Sandra. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I am absolutely thrilled and honored to introduce Rianne Eisler to us today. Um, she has been one of my heroes since I first read The Chalice and the Blade all oh, these many years ago. I don't even wanna say how many years ago that was. Um, she is the recipient of many honor, honors, such as the Distinguished Peace Leadership Award, get, earlier given to the Dalai Lama, and she's internationally known for her groundbreaking contributions as a system scientist, futurist, and cultural historian. Um, as I just noted, she's author of numerous books, one of which is The Chalice and the Blade, which is just a stunning portrayal of anthropological days that, um, that show that the societies that societies that we're familiar with today are not the way things always necessarily were. Um, she's also written um, The Real Wealth of Nations and, and more, more recently in 2019, co-authored with Douglas Fry, a book called Nurturing Our Humanity. Um, she is, um, her innovative work offers perspectives and tools for constructing less violent, more egalitarian, and gender balanced, sustainable um, future societies. Um, she calls them partnership and dominator societies, which I think we'll hear a little bit about in a couple of minutes. Um, she's uh, editor in chief of the online journal, Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies, um, which is published at the University of Minnesota. So uh, Rianne, um, welcome and um, um, I know we're eager to hear from you on it. And um, what, I, I don't, what I've asked Brianne to do is present 20, 25 minutes of work and ideas uh, to us, just sort of explaining some of her basic theories and ideas. And then she and I will have an interactive conversation. And then as usual, we will we'll take questions from um, people who posted them in chat, or if you raise your hand, we'll ask you to unmute and, um, and ask your question. So welcome, Rianne. Well, thank you so much, Sandra and Erica, and I'm very happy to be with all of you at this Intellectual Shamans, Shamans webinar, <laughs> I don't know how you pronounce it, and I'm going to, as Sandra said, give you a brief overview of my work and that of the Center for Partnership Systems, and I'm going to start personally because my passion for this work is rooted in my own experiences as a child refugee with my parents from the Nazis. And these traumas led me to questions that I'm sure many of you have probably asked. When we humans have such great capacities for consciousness, for caring, for creativity, why has there been so much insensitivity, cruelty, destructiveness? Is this inevitable or is there an alternative? And these questions are what eventually, after many years, of course, uh, led to my multidisciplinary whole systems research, identifying the core components of societies that support our positive human capacities, and yes, how to build these societies. And what this research shows, as Einstein famously said, 
is that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that created them. And yes, it did show that there is an alternative. However, we cannot see this alternative uh, using our old consciousness. Now, these two new holistic inclusive, and I emphasize inclusive, social categories that are identified in this research are, as Sandra said, the dominator or domination system and the partnership system. Or rather, because it's always a matter of degree, the partnership domination social scale. Now, by using these categories, we can see essential patterns, configurations, connections that are not visible through the conventional lenses we inherited actually from more rigid domination times. Uh, conventional categories such as right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, capitalist, socialist, Northern, Southern, and so forth. If you think about it, of course, uh, and we are really taught not to think about it, uh, none of these categories tell us uh, anything about what we need to build, what we can build to have a more equitable, more sustainable, uh, more caring way of living. Moreover, and again, we've been taught to take this for granted. If you really think about it, uh, none of these categories and none of the conventional studies of societies, well, they all marginalize or just ignore nothing less than the majority of humanity, women and children. And this is fundamental because what it leads to is that first of all, uh, this old paradigm, this largely domination paradigm that we've inherited uh, makes it impossible to see uh, well what Asir, uh, Asandra uh, mentioned and what is detailed in my book, uh, The uh, uh, Chalice and the Blade, which by the way is now in its 57th US printing and in about 30 foreign editions. What it shows uh, the data and also this new paradigm is that for millennia, human societies in our prehistory actually oriented more to the partnership side rather than the domination side of the partnership domination social scale. For example, this more equitable and sustainable social organization actually lasted well into early agricultural times. For example, Chapalhuyak, which is the largest Neolithic site ever excavated uh, with uh, more gender balance, with uh, much more egalitarian by the size of houses, the size of grave goods, and yes, uh, much more peaceful, no signs of destruction through warfare for a, a thousand years. And we know from archeology span now that warfare, uh, at least in Europe, which is the area where most of the excavations uh, have taken place, in the area around the Mediterranean, uh, warfare is at most five to 10,000 years old. And this lasted uh, in bits and pieces, even into the so-called high civilization of Minoan creed. Now, what we see now using this new inclusive whole systems partnership domination scale, which yes, includes the status of women and children, it makes it possible to see patterns configurations that are otherwise invisible. For example, if you use this frame, we can see that to shift to from domination to partnership, we really don't have to start with square one because what we can see is something that again is presented to us as random, as disconnected, but we see that 
the progressive modern social movements <coughs> actually all challenge the same thing, a tradition of domination. Think about it. The Enlightenment challenged the so-called divinely ordained right of kings to rule their, quote, subjects. The abolitionist civil rights, black rights matter movements challenge, again, the so-called divinely ordained right of a, quote, superior race to rule over inferior ones. Uh, the feminist and now the global women's rights movement challenges the divinely ordained rule of men over the women and children in the, quote, castles, you know, a military image, not coincidentally, of their homes, all the way to the environmental movement, which again challenges our once idealized, hallowed conquest and domination of nature that at our yeah. level of technological development and population could take our species to an evolutionary dead end. However, and this is really vital, what these movements focused on primarily was on dismantling the top of the domination pyramid of politics and economics as conventionally defined, and we'll get to that. They paid scant attention to four interconnected foundations or cornerstones of either domination or partnership-oriented social systems. And it is on the four cornerstones of childhood, gender, economics, and story language that domination systems of strongman rule, of violence, of male dominance, have kept repeating themselves in regression after regression, whether it's Eastern or Western, religious or secular, rightist or leftist. So to build foundations for a system that can support uh, human and planetary well-being, we have to shift these cornerstones from domination to partnership. And the first cornerstone, as I said, is childhood and family. As detailed, and, and Sandra mentioned this, uh, my most recent book, Nurturing Our Humanity, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2019, neuroscience, and the book draws heavily from neuroscience, which verifies these findings. It shows that children's experiences and observations in the first five years, they shape nothing less than the architecture of our brains. And with this, how we feel, think, and act, including how we vote. So how children are raised is not only a family issue, it is a key social and economic issue. Like education, religion, politics, economics, families are embedded in the larger social system. And they're very different depending on the degree of orientation to either end of the partnership domination social scale. Now, ironically, these connections are recognized by those pushing us back to more rigid domination systems of strongman rule, violence, and male dominance. For example, Putin, a strongman ruler who launched his barbaric invasion of Ukraine, in 2018, he substantially reduced the penalty for family violence. So it is much less than for hurting or killing a stranger if you kill a woman, a child, a man, in a family. Now, why? Because he recognizes, as do those with their so-called social issues pushing us back, because of the link between an authoritarian, male-dominated, punitive family that uses violence to instill fear, and an authoritarian, male-dominated, violent, and punitive state, which takes us to the second cornerstone. And I can run, really only go through them very quickly. Uh, and they're all interconnected and mutually supporting. Now, again, the common belief, and again, we've all been taught this, is still that somehow gender roles and relations, well, 
these are secondary, you know, women's issues, gender issues. In fact, they are central social issues. To begin with, ranking. There are two forms, two basic forms of humanity, the female form and the male form. And ranking the male human form over the female human form, and with this enforcing rigid gender stereotypes. That's a template, isn't it? For equating difference with superiority or inferiority, with dominating or being dominated, with being served or serving. And yes, it is a model for all other in-group versus out-group prejudices, whether it's racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, hostility to trans people, and so forth. And again, I want to emphasize this. These connections are clearly visible in regressive violent regimes, whether it was Nazi Germany, a Western secular rightist society, yeah. Stalin's former USSR, a Western leftist one, religious societies, like the Eastern Taliban and ISIS, or the Western so-called rightist fundamentalist alliance. In all of these, a top priority is subordinating women along with other outgroups in the United States, as we know, uh, immigrants, people of different colors, sexual orientation, but in the Middle East, it's either Shia versus Sunni or Sunni versus Shia, uh, et cetera, of course, again, rising anti-Semitism and so forth in this period of regression. Not only that, a key dynamic, and this really will take us to our, our next cornerstone, which is economics. As I said, they're all interconnected. A key dynamic directly related to rigid domination, gender roles and relations, is that the traits and activities that are in domination systems, because this is not a matter of women versus men or men against women, but in the traits and activities that are in domination systems associated with real masculinity, such as conquest, domination, they are ranked, aren't they, over those stereotypically associated with femininity such as caring, caregiving, nonviolence. So there's money for prisons, right? You know, the punitive male head of household is the archetype here. Uh, but there somehow doesn't seem to be enough money uh, for nurturing children, for feeding children, for caring for children, et cetera. By contrast, uh, more partnership-oriented contemporary nations like Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they have more caring policies, universal health care, high-quality, accessible, well-paid child care, generous paid parental leave, and yes, support for a carbon-free natural environment. And again, not coincidentally, these nations have more gender equity in both the family and the state. And in these nations, uh, which, by the way, are regularly in the top ranks of the World Happiness Report, uh, half of the national legislature are composed of women, and they're not socialists. They have a very healthy, very healthy business sector. Um, which illustrates another dynamic that only becomes visible through the lens of the partnership domination by a cultural social scale. As the status of women rises, so also rises the valuing and the reward of traits and activities that are in domination systems relegated to women, as does the number of men engaging in these essential activities which are coded feminine. Uh, so these, and as I really want to emphasize it, they're not socialist society, they're more partnership oriented and therefore more caring societies, which takes us to the third cornerstone, economics. Now, current economic systems, both capitalist and socialist, follow this gendered system of values I've just touched on that fails to adequately value and reward the work of caring for people 
uh, starting at birth and caring for nature in ways that put food on the table and a roof over people's heads. Uh, again, capitalism and socialism, if you think about it, they came out of very in early, very early industrial times in the 1700s and 1800s. We are now in the 21st century post-industrial knowledge service era. But they're not only antiquated economic operating systems, they perpetuate key valuations, key values of more rigid domination times. For example, there is nothing in either capitalist or socialist writings about caring for nature. Why? Because it was seen by both Smith and Marx as there only to be exploited. Moreover, for both men, and this is vital, caring for children, the sick, the elderly, and yes, keeping a clean and healthy home environment, which of course is, in, is related to keeping a clean and healthy planetary environment, it was to be done for free by a woman in a male controlled household. So as late as when uh, Marx wrote, a woman, a wife, yeah and most women were wives, could not sue for injuries negligently inflicted on her. Only her husband could uh, for loss of her services. And unfortunately, this devaluation of care is still perpetuated by the measures, the metrics uh, that we all use worldwide, GDP and GNP. These metrics only give economic value, for example, for trees. We depend on them to breathe, right? When they're dead, when they're log, I mean, when they're just logs. The GDP and GNP do not include the three life-sustaining sectors of the natural economy, the community economy, and the household economies, which, by the way, is one of the things pointed out in the book that Sandra mentioned, the real wealth of nations. So yes, they do not include the care work performed in households, even though studies show that if this work, still primarily done by women, if it were included, it would constitute between 30 to 50% of the reported GDP GNP. So we urgently need a what is really introduced in the real wealth of nations, a new caring economics of partnerism. Yes, of course we need a free market. We don't happen to have one, but uh, we do need markets. And yes, we need enlightened government policies, but we really have to go further to the values behind our current economic systems. And to do this, we urgently need new metrics that show the enormous economic value of caring for nature and for people starting at birth, such as the social wealth indicators now being developed by the Center for Partnership Systems. And you can find out more about that at centerforpartnership.org which takes me to the fourth and last cornerstone story language. Domination systems in position and maintenance requires false stories about reality. Think about it. We have these normative stories, whether it's original sin or selfish genes, and they fight each other, but really it's the same story, isn't it? Violence, domination, they're normal, they're inevitable, uh, we're bad despite the evidence from neuroscience to the contrary. And as I said, that's detailed also in uh, nurturing our humanity. We're also taught these false stories about our past that ignore the powerful evidence from archeology, span from mythology, from linguistics, from even DNA studies about millennia of human cultural evolution before the shift to domination about five to 10,000 years ago. So we have to change this and it's up to every one of us to do that. Now, this is just a short overview. And as I said, you can find more details in my books, in our websites, in uh, the Partnership Technology Toolkit and Workbook we developed with a grant from the Ford Foundation 
at the Center for Partnership Systems and so forth. And I want to add in closing that thousands of organizations today are working to shift us to partnership from domination, but they are doing this in bits and pieces when they're actually part of the global partnership movement. By contrast, those pushing us back, as I noted, have a very integrated political, economic, family, social agenda, focusing on their so-called social issues, focusing on the four cornerstones I briefly described. So those of us working for a better world we are still all over the map, and I urge you to consider that new frame of the partnership domination scale. As Einstein noted, we have to shift from the old language, the old categories we inherited from more rigid domination-oriented times that make it impossible to connect the dots. Uh, we have to shift really to this old actually a very old frame, if you look at it cross-culturally and, and trans-historically, of the partnership domination social scale. So I will stop now. I thank you, and I look forward to our conversations. Thank you so much, Rianne. That's a wonderful overview. Um, so I thought I'd ask a couple of questions um, and invite anyone who's interested in asking Rianne a specific question to either put it into the chat, and I'll call on you, um, or you can raise your um, virtual hand. But I have a couple of questions to start with. Um, so uh, as I noted, your work has inspired my own work ever since I read The Chalice and the Blade um, and was introduced to the powerful idea of uh, partnership uh, cultures and economies in particular, since I'm a business professor and many of us here are. Um, and it's, all, it's in the last, just in the last few weeks when I'm watching all these um, news reports of mass killings, um, virtually two or three a day, it sounds like these days, seems like these days. Um, at least they're getting some attention, but um, it just this seems to me that that in the conservative agenda of um, banning books and um, banning conversations um, and a whole bunch of other um, kinds of um, ways of sort of suppressing and oppressing people. Um, it just seems like it's becoming worse. And um, I, I'm wondering if you can just discuss this apparent worsening, why you think it might be happening, and um, particularly when we're facing clear crises that few people are paying attention to, like, um, the, well, just got to be getting, hopefully getting over a pandemic, climate change, biodiversity loss, and inequality, some of which you alluded to with uh, the economic framing. Well, uh, it's a difficult subject to discuss in a few minutes, but I'll do my best. Uh, what you're seeing, of course, is something I draw in my research from chaos theory, from nonlinear dynamics, from system self-organizing theory. I mean, it's a really a whole systems approach. And it is during periods of extreme disequilibrium that systems can change. We are going through a period of extreme disequilibrium, economically, socially, technologically. And uh, this is uh, a time when people who have a rigid domination mindset uh, through their families, through their cultures, their subcultures, et cetera, uh, they are in denial, aren't they? I mean, denial is something, of, and this is really detailed uh, in uh, nurturing our humanity, drawing from neuroscience. Uh, they learn to be in denial uh, very early on about the pain being caused to them by those who are their caregivers, of course. Uh, who have been, but it isn't the caregiver's fault. I mean, it's something that's transmitted from generation to generation. I mean, the good news is that we're beginning to see a large proportion, at least in certain areas of the world, uh, saying, no, I don't want to bring up my children that way. I don't want to perpetuate these traditions, these punitive, violent, fear-based traditions. So 
it could go either way at this point is what I'm really trying to say. But what's becoming using this new frame very clear is that the struggle for our future is not between capitalism or socialism or right or left. I mean, uh, East and West, North and South, it's between the partnership and domination configurations. And if we pay attention to the research, all, all you really have to do is to observe what those pushing us back are doing, what they're focusing on. I mean, you mentioned the book burnings, the I have control over what my children learn. Uh, that's it. And they're going to teach them these values. Uh, I uh, Studies, by the way, if, if you get a copy of The Chalice and the Blade, please be sure to get one after the 56 printing, because I wrote a new epilogue uh, uh, to it, which takes us to the Trump years, uh, you know, pointing out uh, that I think I mentioned it actually even in that epilogue, but certainly it's in the uh, Nurturing Our Humanity. Uh, studies which are not publicized show that people who voted for Trump also were stuck in rigid gender stereotypes. I mean, they had a horror of women who they considered uppity, right? I mean, just think about how these cornerstones all interrelate. So anyway, yes, of course, we're in a period of, of regression. But if we really look about at it, there are all of these organizations worldwide working for a more caring, more sustainable, more equitable future. But we lack the frame, whereas the people pushing us back have a very coherent frame. And yeah. we've changed them. I, I agree with that. I mean, I think um, to, one person that I've I've been in communications with actually, she's one of the founders of um, the the organization called We All, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Um, um, <laughs> Hunter Hunter uh, Mummins talks about um, progressives being a, a bucket of crabs, where if one crab tries to climb out of the bucket, the others all pull it back down, and I, that relates to the fragmentation. I think that you're talking about. Um, and I know there are like it's like you said, there are tons and tons of people doing a lot of work and they exist in this thing, this situation, this context that Paul Hawken called blessed unrest, separate, small scale, um, oriented towards, if you will, uh, progressive goals, but um, but ineffective because they're too small scale and they don't have the resources and they don't have a coherent ideology because of the bucket of crabs phenomenon. So, um, I, you know, I, I think one of the things that's useful is about, about your work in particular is that it does give us a, sort of a narrative frame um, to think about um, how we might begin to shift the conversation. Um, and, and so I wonder if you can say more about how the how of shifting mindsets and, you know, we all know, we all, I think, in this group know Mindsets are the key to um, transformative change, mindset change, paradigm change. How do we how do we start to do that? How do we? One of the things you know, uh, both my books and the work of the center uh, has really been also focusing on exactly that. What are the tools to accelerate the movement? Uh, one of them I have mentioned to you uh, is the. Uh, really the new metrics. You know, we value what we measure and we measure what we value. And even though there are now all kinds of metrics and we draw from existing metrics, by the way, for this work, uh, they don't really draw enough from neuroscience in terms of the importance of the early childhood years. Uh, they also, only look, it's a sort of a snapshot of what is, you know, the so-called GDP alternatives, whereas the social wealth economic indicators, and we launched, uh, as I said, you can find out about what we launched and what we're uh, trying to accomplish now. Uh, we launched the first iteration of them in 2014, 
Uh, but the problem is that there are 52, and it was very ad hoc, it, there are 52 indicators. And so we are working now on an index and we urgently need funding and partners to work with this. And if you know of funders, if you know of partners, this is an essential thing because if we can show policymakers in both government and business, the economic value of caring for people starting at birth and caring for a natural environment, rather than this terrible GDP GNP, which actually includes as quote, productive work, uh, activities that harm and take life. I mean, think about it, uh, making and selling cigarettes, fast foods, uh, not, not only is that in GDP and GNP, but so are the resulting medical costs and the resulting funeral costs. They're all great for GDP, but they don't include or give value. And it, it, even if it's in the market, uh, caring for people is very low paid because of this gender system of valuations. So it's, it's a question of consciousness. And you're right, Sandra, our categories fragment our consciousness, our stories fragment our consciousness. They make it impossible to really connect the dots. Uh, and we have to. So I yeah. tried. It, 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 it's connecting the dots. It's also, to me, um, well, I have a, a new book coming out called Catalyzing Transformation. It's about bringing together into coherence all of those actors that you're talking about. Um, and, and I have other questions, but I, you know what? There's some good questions in the chat. So I'm going to turn to them. And if we have time, we'll come back to my question. So Isabel Romanowski, you want to um, highlight yourself uh, or unmute yourself and ask your, maybe your first question? Hi, thank you very much. I think um, a little bit you addressed uh, that question, Sandra, in uh, when you talked to Rian. But it was, uh, Rian, what? How do you interpret the increase in polarization, not just in the U.S. but around the world, at the same time that we have so much more consciousness expanding uh, related to understanding that we are in unsustainable times, and we see it at an environmental or social aspects. But there is more consciousness, like in this uh, movement of blessed unrest, pe people are noticing in different places. Yet at the same time, polarization is so. How do you understand this tension? I, I understand it in terms of the struggle between domination and partnership. The people who are, look, climate change denial uh, in the United States, election result denial. Uh, these are very uh, much part of the domination-oriented psyche. It's very rigid, it adapting to change, and we're in a time of enormous change, is very difficult. And there are people like Mr. Trump and company uh, who are exploiting this. Uh, I mean, God-fearing. I mean, what are you talking about? Fear. Um, so both are happening at the same time, but the people pushing us back have this integrated frame. And I cannot make this clear now. I mean, you look at the social issues, childhood, family right, gender, economics, you know, it's not capitalism. It is top-down economics. Uh, it is trickle-down economics, but it could be a, a, an ancient Chinese emperor or an Arab sheik or a Indian Pasha. It doesn't matter. It's that those at the bottom, and these people are convinced that they are dependent, just as they were dependent on punitive parents, right? That they are dependent on the people, they call them job creators, on the top, who are making gazillion more. I mean, the widening gaps between have and have nots is a symptom of the domination regression. And we can no longer afford to be marginal, to have all of these nice little projects on the margin. We have to come together into a partnership movement. 
and that is my work. And as you can see, I'm still at it <laughs> after many years. Uh, persistence, persistence. Uh, but it is depending on you, dependent on you. Um, I mean, if we keep talking about liberal and conservative, we are falling into the fragmentation of consciousness because these people are not conservative. They're not conserving our natural environment. They're not conserving anybody's human rights. Uh, it, it's a misnomer. It's a fragmentation of consciousness, isn't it? And it's a story that's been uh, deliberately promulgated. This, uh, you know, I characterize it as neoliberal economics, um, top-down economics, trickle-down economics, um, and very coherently, as you suggest, very coherently conveyed over many, many years at this point. And so that we we sort of were in this bubble where we think that things can't be any different, and yet your work so neatly highlights that things can be different. Well, this is the thing. In order to really understand what we can create, we also need a different story of our past. And that story is emerging in bits and pieces. I mean, I'm, I'm just one of the people putting it together. Um, and yes, agenda equity is part of the story, the valuing of the so-called feminine. And I emphasize so-called. My late husband, David Loy, he was a very caring man. And you know, there are uncaring women. Uh, this is, uh, you know, women called men who are caring very often, sissies, weak sisters, right? Uh, I think we have to get away from this very personalized feeling that when we're talking about gender, we're talking about, you know, some kind of a, the war of the sexes. Well, war, the war of the sexes, they're built into domination systems, but it doesn't have to be this way. And we're not talking about an ideal society, by the way. I mean, but we're talking about a much better, much better, much saner, much more realistic way of living and earning a living. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bill Judge, you want to unmute yourself? And uh, if other people have questions, you can put them in chat or you can put up your hand. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's it's a privilege to hear you and be with you. Um, I often extol the virtues of Scandinavian societies. Um, you know, health, well-being, economy. Just it's a sane island in this global uh, world that we live in. And when I talk about it to others, at first they resist it. Uh, but those who have had some contact with Scandinavian countries say, yes, but it will only work in small hom homogeneous societies. It could never work in large, uh, diverse economy like the United States. What is your reaction to that observation? Well, it's a wonderful argument, but it happens to not be true. Um, for example, these uh, Northern European uh, nations invest more than uh, other so-called developed nations in helping people with whom they don't share. You know, it relates to the selfish genes argument, of course, uh, which we've all been indoctrinated with, whether it's original sin, selfish genes. Uh, they invest more in helping people of totally unrelated genes. Uh, no, it is that they are more partnership oriented. And once you understand the configuration of the kind of family, uh, as well as state and business and so on, and they're not ideal, but they have or they have moved more. The fact that 40 to 50 percent of the legislature, national legislature is female, it's a dynamic as the status of women, as I said, rises. So also does the value. I mean, it, it, we, we, we don't connect the dots and we have to learn from this. Uh, I, I think that the fact that we are seeing so many experiments, uh, but they're all on the margins of people of various races, of various ethnic origins, of various religions working together, disproves this. But 
you know, I tell you, uh, I don't like to spend my time arguing with the people who, uh, I, I want to really have the people who are committed, like, like this group, or you wouldn't be here, uh, to really start talking in your, you know that you're still in your business courses, I mean, not your business courses, but in our business courses, in our economic courses, we teach people to distinguish between productive and reproductive work. And we classify the essential work of caring for people when it's not in the market as reproductive. Well, this is nonsense. It is comes out of the what, what I said, you know, more rigid domination times. Uh, so we need to change that. We need to, student, young people, many young people, not all, I mean, not all, but many young people are so hungry for a new paradigm. Teach this new paradigm. We're working, and I invite you to, to uh, be part of the group that utilizes this with uh, a, a professor of history at the University of Arkansas to put together some modules that can be incorporated in different courses on this new paradigm. And if you're interested in it, uh, Bill and anybody else, please uh, let me know. I think you have my email. Uh, you have the Center Center for Partnership. Uh, 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 um, uh, join our mailing list help with funding. Uh, funding the Social Wealth Economic Index is so important. And the foundations are so siloed, just like the academy is so siloed. I, I mean, well, I could go on and on. But the point of it is this. This work isn't just about deconstruction, about, you know, it, it is about reconstruction. Yeah. And that is the main point. You, you can say, oh, let's make, you know, make it hard for people to, to, to manage or what have you, which was, you know, Marx's approach, let's dis disrupt things. No, you want to show people that there is a better alternative and how to build it, for goodness sakes. Thanks, Rianne. Um, Gerard, you want to um, ask your question? I was curious, uh, you, you mentioned children as the first cornerstone, and uh, uh, it, I, I just think about all the social media and, and, the, uh, and the feedback loops that take place within that, that seem to be in a broader level even, drawing and polarizing people even more. Uh, the uh, advent of artificial intelligence making it difficult for people even to recognize the difference between truth and lies. Uh, within that context, and let me add one more wrinkle to this, uh, we're being told by scientists that we need to have greenhouse gases in the next 10 years. Uh, and I was just wondering how you would see this from a systems perspective, bringing all these different pieces of the issue together. I, I hope that's clear enough. Yes, well, thank you very much for that, uh, bringing that up, tools. One of the tools that we have developed with a grant from the Ford Foundation, a small grant, uh, unfortunately, was uh, a technology par partnership toolkit. And we are adapting it now and shortening it uh, for uh, other uses because it, it, it works for families, communities, but the issue is not the technology per se, as you know, it's how it is programmed. And this toolkit is designed to ask ourselves and to rate ourselves on a scale as to what are the conscious or and unconscious uh, attitudes, often biases, we have all internalized. I mean, I know that transformation is possible because I've experienced it in my own life. You know, I mean, I, I for example, I had a legal <laughs> background and one day the head hunter of my firm, Beverly Hills Entertainment Firm that I worked for, called me in to compliment me by telling me, you don't think like a woman. And I took it as, as a compliment instead of as a terrible insult that it is. So I just give this as an example of 
you we can awaken and 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 my books i mean it is tragic that people are taught this short attention span but a lot of people are reading i mean bookstores are doing well it's very interesting it's uh what isabel has talked about you know you see both don't you and the question is can we be coherent enough to have an integrated movement focusing on these four cornerstones. And you as educators have an enormous capacity to uh, recommend these books to your students, uh, to really internalize some of it and use it in your courses. And that's all we can do is the best we can and to become a coherent partnership movement. Uh, Marty, do you do you want to still ask your question, or do you feel that Rianne just addressed it? Well, I think she's uh, approached it in a number of the responses because the questions that are being asked, I think, are very relevant to what my concerns are and my questions in the chat, and that is that this group, as she's identified, is kind of preaching to the choir. I think all of us in this humanist management group are interested in. Uh, really new strategies to approach uh, how we live economically and personally and, and in our worldviews. My concern is that I'd like to know if your research, Rihanna, has ever pointed out maybe two or three interventions you've done when you've gone into domination systems and spoke or the impact of a book or of these new toolkits you're putting together, what has been those techniques that actually can break confirmation bias and at least have them look at themselves a little bit more objectively rather than our natural response, which is to just listen to the stuff that confirms what we already believe. That's a very human thing to do and psychologists have studied it for eons. What have you found to be a few of the most successful techniques when you're either speaking or writing and people actually examine their own biases? Well, uh, I will answer this in, in as briefly as I can. Uh, my goal right now is more reaching not the people who are stuck in the domination trance. Because I think that whether you, they will only move if the norms move. Oh, okay. And if we don't join together with a coherent, integrated political family, family, we have to reclaim family, we have to reclaim morality, then we can really slowly, slowly uh, bring about change. But uh, I, I cannot emphasize enough that the problem as I see it right now is that we're, well, Sandra said it, we're like the crabs, right? I mean, and, and we're, we're, we need a coherent, integrated political family social movement and the tools and i'm so glad that gerald uh asked me about that the the tools uh we will have them we are now working on the partnership technology toolkit which will be just a partnership toolkit to really examine our own thinking and to also give some information to people about this new paradigm, because otherwise we're all over the map. You know, right, left, religious, secular, environmentalist, non-environmentalist. Um, I, I, I think that let's focus on teaching the students who have some opening that there is a better way. Let's do that. And let's strengthen our movement. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rianne. There's it, we're running out of time. There's a couple of really good questions. I know Manuel Manga has one, and Betty Woodman had also raised a very 
a probably controversial one, but I think it would be um, interesting. I wonder if um, both Manuel and Betty could unmute themselves and ask their questions quickly. So very, very quickly. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Rianne. Good to see you. My question has to do with the need for strategic collaboration among organizations like yours and others to collaborate for building that future world. Uh, like Rick Hansen here in Berkeley last week launched the Global Coalition, Compassion Coalition Movement, and big movement. So compassion and caring go together. That's it. And Betty? I, I, I want to say, Manuel, it's good to see you, and it's also good to see Betty. Abrazo. Uh, abrazos. Yes, gracias. Uh, but I think we need to be, uh, for ourselves, we need to be more specific about the configuration and about the four cornerstones, because these are the cornerstones on which domination systems keep rebuilding themselves in various uh, iterations, whether it's totalitarianism, whether it's religious so-called fundamentalism, which is really domination fundamentalism. I mean, think about what they preach, fear, and, and how much they emphasize preserving the quote traditional family, which is a code word for a rigidly male dominated, violent, punitive, authoritarian family. I mean, let's call things what they are, for goodness sakes. So I, I, I urge you in that movement to introduce this new way, which is really an old way of, of thinking and make it the partnership movement or, but, but, but talk about the four cornerstones, whatever you do, because if you don't, they, they, they will keep rebuilding themselves on these same foundations. Thanks. And Betty, you can you quickly frame your question? I'm not sure it's okay. Uh, sure. The last minute here. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, it just, it's, it was a question for the men in the group about whether you think it could be helpful to have a program or a series of programs that really looks at any discomfort many men may have uh, because of gender ideologies and because of socialization and because of um, middle school bullying on the playground, right, to really fully step up and embrace emotional intelligence as well as IQ and to embrace caring. I know we all work in this world and we see a lot of pressure that's put on men, and yet those gender ideologies and socializations and views really are such a big impediment to moving from the dominator to partnership cultures, the move that we need so desperately. So I wonder if there could be a way wrapped into leadership discussions or whatever to really address uh, what's often not said about the discomfort many men have. I think understandably a, have because of what's the way we socialize men. Betty, I think that's a wonderful idea. And uh, in, in, indirectly, it's being done in men's groups, of course, re-examining, quote, masculinity. I mean, but, and, and emphasizing, I, I hope, again and again, that this is not a question of women against men or men against women. It's something we've all internalized to various degrees. So thank you. And I wish you luck with this initiative. I hope it works. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you all. And I thank you, Sandra, for your leadership in this. And do send me the uh, chats, the chats. Um, I would really like to look at them. I haven't on purpose because it distracts you and I'm not, I'm really not of the generation that can do this, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, doing 12 things at the same time. Thank you so much, Rianne, for joining us today and for this really inspiring talk. Um, I know there are a couple people who might want to get in touch with you. So um, I suggest people email me, my last name at bcbostoncollege.edu if you want to. Uh, and I'll put you in touch with the Partnership Center and um, Leah, Rianne's assistant, can take it from there. But Rianne, this was just amazing, everything I'd hoped for. And um, I know there's so many thank yous going on in chat at the moment. Um, 
So I know everybody appreciated it. Um, so thank you everyone for showing up. Sorry to run over a bit here um, and see you all in the fall probably. Wonderful. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Rianne. I think I speak for everyone. This is just a tremendous honor to be here today. Thank you. Thank you all. And I'm counting on you to be agents of cultural transformation from domination to partnership. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Bye, Manuel.